Good morning, and welcome to Divine Savior Church, where we're all about changing lives with Jesus as we worship, connect, and serve. Glad you're here today and that you're going to worship Jesus with us, and it's my prayer that you're built up in your faith, that Jesus is, in fact, your Savior and your God. Uh, if you're worshiping with us today for the first time, there's a Connect tab up on the right side of your screen. Uh, would love to connect with you, love to see how we can serve you better. If you have a prayer request, go ahead and get that in there, and uh, I'd be happy to pray for you this week. I'm excited today, uh, as always, but today especially because we're starting a brand new series called God Can We Talk. We live in a world where we are super connected. We have devices, we have computers, we have people all around us, and, and yet oftentimes we can feel alone. And we want to talk to people. And yet, we want a deep relationship in order to talk and pour out our hearts. And that's what we want in our God. Our God knows our hearts, and we want to have a relationship with Him where we can pour out our heart to Him in every single situation. Whether it's happy and joyful, and we want to tell Him how awesome He is, or if it's, we're hurting, we're sad, we're troubled and depressed. And so God... Can we talk? That's what we're going to be uh, talking about for the next several weeks as we look at different psalms in the Old Testament. Today we're starting with the theme, God, I'm hurting. No matter who we are, we've hurt. And what does a heart look like that comes to their God and pours out their heart to Him? That's what we're going to talk about today. And you're going to see in the, t in the theme of the entire service from our scripture readings to the message this, mo uh, this morning. God bless your worship as we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, you tell us to come to you, to cast all our anxiety on you, uh, because you care for us. And we know that's true because you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, uh, to save us from our sin, to conquer death, so we can live with you forever. You love us more than we could ever imagine. And so, uh, as we begin this new series, we ask that uh, you strengthen our faith uh, and that you give us the courage to pour out our heart and our soul to you. And then let us be filled with your word. We ask today that as we gather around your word, uh, that you send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to strengthen our faith, to guide us, to lead us uh, in all things. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin this morning with our opening song, Speak, O Savior, I Am Listening. Speak, O Savior, I am listening As a servant to his Lord Let me show
Jesus, hear me. Let your words in me take root. May your spirit air be near me, that I bear abundant fruit. May I daily sing your praise from my heart, glad and thumbs raise till my highest praise is given in the endless joy of heaven. As we come before our Father in heaven this morning, uh, we do so with repentant hearts. And so it's good for us to confess our sin to Him. And we're going to do so uh, using the words found in the notes section uh, on our live stream. And if you're not there, you can listen. And then after we confess uh, the words together, there'll be time for you to confess what's weighing on your heart this morning. We confess our sins. Merciful Father in heaven, since the beginning of the world, you have desired a relationship with your people, including me. I confess that I am sinful and oftentimes neglect our relationship. I fail to pray to you in good times and in bad, and I struggle to make your word a priority in my life. I know that because of my sin, I don't deserve to be called your child. So this morning I confess these sins and all my sins, and I ask for your mercy and forgiveness. The amazing thing about our God is that He wants a relationship with you so badly that He has removed every obstacle that gets in your, the way of your relationship with Him. And that, of course, is your sin. It's my sin. And He's completely removed it, not by overlooking it, not by uh, putting a rug over it. He, he removed it through His Son, Jesus. God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he sent his one and only son to take our sin and to die on the cross for us and to rise victoriously from the grave. And it's because of Jesus and what he's done that all your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Uh, that you have removed every barrier between us and you. Uh, You removed our sin through Jesus' perfect life and innocent death and resurrection. And because of him, we stand forgiven in your sight. We thank you for it. Help us to live in this grace every single day. Amen. As we look at this topic, uh, God, can we talk, and God, I'm hurting, Uh, We're going to look at a few scripture lessons this morning uh, so that we can kind of get a full round picture of this whole thing. And today we're going to start with Romans chapter 8. Here at the very end of the section, this is a section all about us being more than conquerors in, in Jesus. Life has its problems. Life has its hurts, has its troubles. And yet when we hurt, it's, it's not because God's mad at us. It's not because God's getting back at us. What Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 is that nothing can separate us from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's a comfort for you and me when we're hurting. We don't have to sit here and wonder, is it because I did this? Is it because I did that? No. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. A lesson from Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. 
Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word. Notice what Paul says. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword, all those are hurts that we face. But none of them separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The gospel lesson for today comes from John chapter 16. Here it's the night before Jesus died. He's in the upper room talking with his disciples. And Jesus wants them to know and tells them, all of you are about to abandon me. There are a lot of times in our life when uh, we feel abandoned, when nobody understands, when we feel very alone. Jesus knows exactly what that feels like. And here he tells us, actually, we're never alone. John chapter 16. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you now believe? Jesus replied, A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is God's word. We have troubles, we have hardships, Jesus did too. When we hurt, we feel alone, Jesus did too. But Jesus knew that the Father is always with him, and that's true for you and me. More importantly, or just as important, Jesus has overcome the world. That includes your troubles, your hardships, your sin. The sin of the world that causes all the problems, all the hurts, all the pains, Jesus has overcome it, and one day it will all end. That's a hope we have, even in the midst of our hurt. We're going to hear more about that in the sermon this morning. But now, children, I have a devotion for you. I hope you can see this picture. What is that? It's a big old deer, isn't it? He's drinking water. What do you think made this deer so thirsty? Maybe he's running around having fun with other deer. Maybe he's running. Maybe a lion was chasing him and, and he finally got away from the lion and now he's just thirsty. Uh, maybe he just hadn't seen water in a long time. Maybe there was a drought and now he's thirsty. We know what it's like to be thirsty too, right? Have you ever been outside playing in the hot summer sun and you just want to go inside because you want a long drink of water, that is thirst. Our body needs water uh, in order to live. And when we don't have it, we feel that thirst, that longing for water. In the same way, our soul thirsts, but not for water, for God. Just like our body needs water in order to live, our soul needs God in order to live. And that's what we have in his word. When we read the Bible, you can think of it as having a, a big drink of water for your soul. Because that's what it is. When our souls are, are feeling down, we're feeling grumpy, we're angry, we're upset, we can take a long sip of water from God's word and it revives and, and gives us hope and restores us. And so remember that, that uh, just like our body needs water, our soul needs the word of God daily because that is the water for our soul. Otherwise, our souls get dehydrated. And in the word of God, what gives us hope, what revives us? 
It's hearing about our Savior Jesus, how much He loves you, how much He cares for you, that He died for you, He rose for you, so that one day you can go to heaven. It's this message from God's Word that brings you up, that fills you, that quenches your thirst in your soul. This week, as you feel thirsty, let it be a reminder, hey, my soul's probably thirsty too. And open up the God's Word and drink from it. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you have given us your word. Uh, we thank you that it's, it satisfies us just like a cold drink of water. We ask that this week we continue to drink from it daily so that our souls may be satisfied and we may have hope. Amen. We'll continue, we'll continue with the sermon. I read somewhere this week that the average human being has 36 human interactions a day between your kids, your spouse, your coworkers, your boss, your church members, your neighbors, uh, the uh, Starbucks employees. The average human being talks t to 36 different humans in a day. How do most of those conversations go at the beginning? I think they look something like this. You walk up and the person says, how are you? And how do you always respond? I'm good. Or I'm great. Even when we're not feeling good and great, we say good and great. There are times when we walk into Starbucks and we're feeling down. We're feeling depressed, dejected. And when we walk in and the Starbucks employee says, how are you? How often don't we say, good? Why is that? It's because in order to pour out your soul to somebody, you need to have a deep relationship with that person. You need to feel comfortable. You need to feel safe. You need to feel secure. You need to know that the person isn't just going to look back at you and stare at you and not know what to say. That's why all these pleasantries get thrown back and forth. Imagine what it would look like if you walked into Starbucks and the Starbucks employee said, how are you today? And you said, well, you know what, let me tell you. And you just unloaded all of your problems. They would probably stare back at you and not know what to say. Maybe they'd say, I'm sorry. And then you feel foolish. We need to have a deep relationship with somebody and trust and security in order to open up. Do you have that with God? When was the last time you opened up your soul, opened up your heart to God and just poured out what was wrong? When was the last time you just let Him know what was going on inside your heart? Do you have that deep relationship with him? Or at times do you feel like God is more like an acquaintance? Where in your prayer life you say, I'm good. God, I'm good. Even though everything around you is burning down. Have you got past the point in your relationship with God where you're not just exchanging pleasantries, but you're having deep conversation and you're letting all of your heart out? 
If you feel like God's an acquaintance and you don't have that relationship, maybe it's because you've kept him there. Maybe it's because you haven't completely opened up and let God know what is going on. And this is the exact reason we're doing this series, and we're starting it today. We're starting this brand new series called God Can We Talk? And what we're doing is is we're looking through some of the Psalms in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is almost smack dab right in the middle of the Old Testament, uh, and it's known as the hymn book of the Jewish people. These were the songs that they sang at the temple, but they were more than that. These were deep prayers to God. As we're going to see, it's, it's written over 500 years by many different authors, and all the authors just pour their heart out to God. And they do so in many different topics. Today, we're starting with the theme, God, I'm hurting. No matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter your race, no matter your gender, we've all hurt. We have hurt. We're We may be hurting today, and we will hurt in the future. Where is there hope in the midst of hurt? That's what we're going to see today as we uh, look at Psalm 42, because the author in Psalm 42 is hurting. And so let's look at his prayer. Let's look at him pour out his soul to God, and let's see what we can take away from it. Psalm 42, we're beginning with verse 1. Here's what we're told. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? Do you remember what it's like to be really thirsty? When I was a kid uh, playing outside in my grandma's backyard, uh, I remember a time when I was so thirsty. Back then, it would be in summer, my cousins would be over, and Grandma would just let us out and play all day. And her, her backyard butted up against four baseball fields, Little League baseball fields. She lived by field four. Way down by field one was a long ways away. Well, I remember one day we were way down at the other end, and it, we'd been out in the hot sun for a long time, and I just felt drained. I was so thirsty, and all I wanted was a glass of water. The only problem is Grandma's house was way down there. And the longing, the thirst, the panting for a glass of water. And then when you finally get to take a sip of it, it it just tastes so good and you are revived. But until you have that glass of water, when you're out in the hot sun like that, you just feel down. You feel dejected. That's how the psalmist is feeling. That's how the author is feeling. But he's not quenching, or he's not uh, thirsting, longing for a cold glass of water. He's longing for God. His soul feels dehydrated. Why? He tells us in verse 3 My tears have been my food day and night. He's hurting, he's grieving, he's crying. We know what it's like to to cry and have tears stream down our face and you get the saltiness of your tears in your mouth. That's what the author is tasting. And his tears are his food. He's so grieving, he's so hurting that he's not even eating. He's just crying. What's he crying about? Well, the rest of the psalm goes on to tell us. He says, "My, My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, 
Where's your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within, within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Look at how this author just pours out his soul to God. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't say everything's good, I'm happy, I'm blessed. No. He is hurting. And there are several reasons that he's hurting. Number one is he, he doesn't feel that God is present. Where can I go to meet with God? For an Old Testament believer, the place to go meet with God was the temple. There the presence of God was. There the word of God was. And this author isn't near Jerusalem. He doesn't have the presence of God. He feels alone. He is being taunted by his enemies. Where's your God? He feels oppressed. He has troubles sweeping over him, he says. His bones are in mortal agony. And finally, he feels forgotten by God. God is nowhere around. He remembers what it's like to go to the house of God where there's other uh, believers around. He remembers what it's like to go to God, to be with God, and to meet with God. But now, he can't do that. He's hurting. He's grieving. He says, God, I hurt. We can relate, can't we? For the past three months, maybe four months now, we have not been able to go and meet with God. We haven't been able to go to church. We haven't been able to gather with other Christians, other believers, and and praise God. And we know what it's like to feel very alone. Maybe you've been uh, just in your house, and you haven't really gone anywhere, and, and you just feel lonely. You, we, we have troubles that sweep over us. As you look over the 2020, just the past six months, you could pick any number of troubles that we've experienced. But on top of those, we have other troubles. We know what it's like to feel betrayed. We know what it's like to have sickness and disease. We know what it's like to, to have a loved one die. Maybe we are dying ourselves. We know what it's like to be accused of wrongdoing when we're innocent. We know what it's like to, to lose a child. We hurt. We felt oppressed. We have felt taunting from others. If you've ever been taunted by a bully at school, you know the weight that it has on your heart and the hurt that it causes. And we know what it's like to feel like we're forgotten by God. Because if we're honest, that's how we feel when we're hurting. Forgotten. See, the sad reality is that we live in the 21st century where we, we are super connected. We have cell phones, we have computers, we, we're connected more than any generation before, and yet we feel so alone, especially when we're hurting. It's true for not just you and me, but it's true for uh, all people across America. I was listening to the radio the other day, and I heard a, a new song, at least <laughs> new to me. Um, but it's, it's by a, an artist called, his name is Love, And he wrote a song called Modern Loneliness. Uh, he wrote it back in 2018, and in a recent interview, he said that uh, he wrote it at a time in his life when he was extremely depressed. It was a really bad time in his life. He was depressed, he was down, and he was having obsessive, dark thoughts. Thoughts that robbed him of his self-worth and uh, robbed him of any love in the world. He was hurting. And in the lyrics that he brings out, you can tell that he's hurting. But here's what he says in the refrain. He says, modern loneliness, we're never alone, but we're always depressed. Yeah, I love my friends to death, but I never call and I never text. In the midst of his hurting heart, he stays hurting alone. He's connected. 
He's got friends that he can call, that he can text, but he doesn't. He, he stays hurting alone. And isn't that how a lot of us deal with our hurt? We hurt alone. We don't talk to anybody about it. Not even our God. Why is that? Well, God's not here. We can't sit down with God face to face and talk with Him. And if we do pour out our heart and soul, it's not like God's responding down from the sky. We just say it all and then it just kind of hangs out there. And we start to wonder, God, are you here? God, do you care? God, I'm just going to deal with this by myself. You see, the, the, there's a big misconception in Christianity. The, the big misconception is that when you become a Christian, that you should just be happy and blessed all the time, that, that the world could be burning down around you, and yet you should put a smile on your face because you're happy and blessed, and that's what God expects from you. And if you're not, then God's going to be angry at you. But that's not true. Christians hurt. God knows it. But there's a big difference between the way a Christian hurts and the way the world hurts. And it's really demonstrated uh, as you look at the lyrics of Modern Loneliness in Psalm 42. Modern Loneliness refrain is, I never call, I never text. There's no solution to the problem. Psalm 42 pours his soul, his whole heart out to God. And there's a solution to the problem. The refrain in Psalm 42 is this. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. For the Christian who is hurting, there is hope. And in the midst of our hurt, we're able to say, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in in God, my Savior, and my God. Do you know why we can have hope in God? Because God knows that you hurt. God knows that every single human being has hurt since Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve fell into sin, sin has been in the world, and every single human being from that moment on has experienced hurt. And God didn't just stay up in heaven. He didn't just look down and not know what to say. He, he didn't just have pity on us. No, God entered our hurt. God took on human flesh because that's what the children have. The Bible says because the children have flesh and blood, He too had flesh and blood so that He could empathize with us in our weakness. Jesus knows the hurt you're going through. He's experienced the hurt you're going through. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed. Jesus knows what it's like to be accused of wrongdoing when he's innocent. Jesus knows what it's like to have sickness. Jesus knows what it's like to, to feel like your bones are in agony. Jesus knows what it's like to have troubles of every kind. Jesus knows what it's like to feel alone. Jesus knows what it's like to be dying. Jesus knows what it's like to have a loved one die. Even God the Father, even God the Father knows what it's like to have a child die. Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus entered our hurt so deep. He jumped in so hard, so deep, that he died. But through his death, he eliminated, he overcame the very cause of every single hurt that you have. The root cause of every single problem, every single trouble, every single hurt that you have is sin. And it's been that case uh, that way since Genesis chapter 3 at the very beginning. And Jesus has overcame every single one of them. On the cross, there when he died, he overcame every single sin that causes you pain. 
He not only empathizes, he's not only conquered your sin and your hurts, but now he wants to have a conversation with us. Jesus ascended up into heaven and now he sits at the right hand of God in his throne in heaven, but he hasn't left us. One of our hesitancy to open up our heart and just pour out our soul to him is that there's going to be no response and yet he has. It's right here in his word. Prayer and reading the word of God is a conversation with God. We pray and we talk to God and God responds back to us in his word. And do you know what he says? As we pour out our soul to the living God, Jesus responds to us in the text of his word. And he says, I hear you. I'm the living God. I I don't have mute ears or or, uh, deaf ears and a mute tongue like like the idols that you so desperately want to worship. I'm the living God who hears you. I'm the living God who took on human flesh just like you so that I can empathize in your weakness. So that the hurts that you're feeling, I felt them and I empathize with you. He texts back and he says, I don't want you to think that the reason you're going through this is because God's mad at you for some reason. I don't want your deceptive heart to to trick you into believing that uh, God's angry at you, that it must be uh, because of some sin. No, all of your sin has been forgiven. It's been wiped away. You're at peace with God. He texts back and he says, I know that you're hurting, but have hope. Because I've saved you from this hurting world. Every hurt that is weighing on your heart has an expiration date. And that date is when you come to me in heaven. He texts back and he says, Until that day, until I bring you to heaven, I want you to know that I will never leave you. You are always connected to me. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Nothing can separate you from my love. You see, the reason we can pour out our heart to the living God uh, is because he has a response and he knows exactly what to say. And it's right here in his word. He's the one who gives us hope. He's the one who who revives our soul. And as we we take this word and we read it, it's like our soul is taking a big swig of water and we're revived. We're restored. Our soul goes from being downcast and disturbed to being lifted up. And we have hope once again that these hurts will end. Because they will. Because he has overcome the world. Our living God speaks hope into a hurting heart. And he does so through his word. God, can we talk? He says, absolutely. He he says, I've got a lot to tell you. And I've got a lot of hope to fill your hurting heart with. But before we close up, I uh, I want to tell you a couple things. Number one, as you pour your heart out to God, as you do so, make sure you have the word of God next to you. Because otherwise we pour out our heart to God and it's, it's like modern loneliness. We pour it out and there's no hope. It's just out there. Pour out your heart to God and then read his word. And what a blessing it is for you and me living in the 21st century. Unlike the, the author of the psalm, he had to go to the temple to hear the word of God. You and I, we have the word of God right on our phones as we go around every single day. We can download the Bible app and we can pull out the phone, our phone and read God's word wherever we go. Think about that. If you want to look at it this way, it's literally like God is sending you a text message on your phone. His word is with you to give you hope and to revive you. And then number two, the, what, I want, what I want you to take away from here is notice this psalm. As we pour out our heart to God and and we have hope as we read it, it, it's not like we're just going to stay there. 
This psalm is very much a roller coaster, up and down, up and down. He's going down and he's having hardships. Put your hope in God. And then he's back down. Put your hope in God. That's the life of a Christian. We are going to have hurts. We're going to have troubles. We're going to be down. But it's the word of God that gives us hope. It's the word of God that brings us back up and restores us. And so as you pour out your heart, don't think this is going to be a, a fix and everything's just going to be back to normal and it's going to be good. It will for a while, but you're going to ride that roller coaster and that's why it's important to, to continue having these deep conversations with God. Keep talking to Him and let Him talk to you because He does have hope for your hurting heart. We're getting ready to move into a new building. We're getting ready to, to be in a new facility where we're going to have a church, a school, and it's a beautiful building. And we're excited about it. But what are we excited about? Are, are we excited because it's, it's a beautiful building? Yes. Are we excited because there's a school? Yes. Are we excited because there's more room for more people? Yes. Are we excited because there's going to be comfy chairs? Yes. But what are we most excited about? Is that it's going to be a place where people who hurt can come and have hope. It's going to be a place where, where people who are wanting the presence of God, who are having troubles of every kind, who feel oppressed, who feel forgotten, who are feeling taunted by the enemy, all our problems, all of our hurts, we can come and we can hear the word of God. And we can hear God's word as he speaks hope to our hurting heart. This will be a place where we will constantly hear about our Savior Jesus, who has overcome the world, who has overcome every single hurt that we have, and that one day all this is going to end, and we will be home with him in heaven. It will be a place where we get to drink deep from the waters of the living God, and he will satisfy our souls. May God be with you this week as you drink deeply from his word, as you pour your heart out to him, pour every heart out to him, because he not only empathizes, but he's overcome every single hurt, and he is with you. And it's in him that we have our hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, this world has so many hurts. Uh, there are so many hurts and troubles that weigh on our hearts uh, and oftentimes we don't know where to go. We don't know who to talk to. But you invite us to come to you, to pour out our hearts to you, pour out our souls, and to find hope in your word. And that's what, exactly what we find here. We have a Savior, Jesus, who has saved us from all of our hurts, all of our pains, all of our troubles. He has saved us from our sin, and he's conquered, our, he's conquered death. As we hurt as a Christian, we don't have to put on a mask and act like everything's okay when it's not. We get to pour out our hearts to you, and we get to be real with you. We ask that you help us to do that this week. And then, let us keep the Word of God right next to us so that we can read your Word and be filled with the hope that we have, the hope that is in Jesus. We ask you to let us be shining examples of what this looks like to the world that is hurting. Everyone around us is hurting, not just us. And let us uh, be shining examples of the hope that we have which is our hope in Jesus. We ask all this in Jesus' name. It's in his name that we join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we leave our service today, we do so with the blessing of the Lord, the same blessing that he instructed Aaron the high priest to give the Israelites in 1500 BC. And it's so that we know that we're not going out alone, but that the Lord goes with us into all of our hurts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We're going to close our service today by singing, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. The Lord bless your week.
Signals given 